Um, okay, so uh, in chapter one of Dracula, we also get a sense of um, how he views the setting, right? And so when I'm thinking of the setting of Dracula, a word comes to mind, and that is ominous, right? And if you don't know what that word means, it means like dark, it's an omen or a hint uh, that something bad is about to happen, right? And so there's a lot of language that Bram Stoker, our Stoker, sorry, our author uses to create this feeling of unease, right? As we are reading this, um, y'all know that this is a scary story, right? I mean not scary in 2021 terms, but you know, I mean, essentially the legend of Dracula. Take yourself back like 200 years, right? This would have been a terrifying story, right? You didn't have the visuals, so what you had was text, and that text, the way it kind of creeps along, just gives you a hint that something dangerous and negative is out there. Um, and now that, that's who he was writing to. He never would have imagined that Miss Ritchie's English class in 2021 would be reading this novel. He was writing to the audience of his time. So what I'd like to do is I would like to dig into a part of the passage, okay? Um, and we're going to kind of pull that apart and we're going to look for words that create that ominous feeling in the reader, that dangerous something bad is about to happen feeling. Okay, so in Brom Stoker's, why do I keep saying Stoker? Brom Stoker Dracula, this is where I'm getting the passage from. Okay, so here we go, Project Gutenberg. This is the book, hopefully you've read it. If you haven't read it, it's not too late. We're only one chapter in. So there's his first entry, the 3rd of May, the 4th of May. It's in the 5th of May that we're going to look. And it's the paragraph that begins, when it grew dark, there seemed to be some excitement amongst. That's the passage we're going to look at. You can find a copy of this passage in Google Classroom. If you look over at Dracula Chapter 1 Cami passage and pull that up, I have copied the text here for you. So you can make annotations on Cami as we read. So here we go. Here's the passage in Dracula. And what I want you to do as we read is I want you to highlight the words and images that create the ominous feeling. Okay? So just over here on the side of Cami, you see the um, icon that says markup. Make sure you click that. And over on the side, I've got text highlighter. And I like green, so I'll be highlighting in green. You can highlight in whatever color you want. Maybe we should do black because it's ominous and that seems like. But I'm going to stick with green because that's my favorite color. Okay, so that's what that's what you need to do. You need to go to markup, text highlighter, pick the color you want. And there's even a whole palette down here that we could pick more colors from. Okay, <clears throat> when it grew dark there seemed to be some excitement amongst the passengers. And they kept speaking to him one after the other, as though still urging him full speed. This is not the passage that I wanted to pull. Oh, yes, no, it is the passage I wanted to pull. Good, okay. Um, and they kept speaking to him one after the other, as though urging him to further speed. He lashed the horses unmercifully with his long whip and with wild cries of encouragement, urged them on to further exertion. Then, through the darkness, I could see a patch of gray light ahead of us, as though there were a cleft in the heel. The excitement of the passengers grew greater. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather springs and swayed like a boat tossed on a stormy sea. I had to hold on. I'm going to stop right there and give us a minute to highlight all the words and images that create this dangerous feeling. So for me, grew dark is one of them. What is it for you? this feeling that something bad is about to happen.
<clears throat> I've highlighted some things that I see. You might certainly see something else, which is totally fine. There's not just one way to look at this. So if I was going to look at this and just look at the words that I and images that I've picked out apart from the way they appear in the story, I see a lot of dark images. Dark, stormy sea, gray light, darkness. Um, so, so that idea of the time of day or the fact that it's shadowy and dark seems to be happening over and over again, and that creates some unease in me, right? Uh, some of his other word choices do too, but that is certainly something that I'm noticing here. I'm noticing the color a lot. Okay, as I keep reading this paragraph, I want you guys to follow along and highlight the things you see that create this ominous, feeling, this feeling that something bad is about to happen, okay? The road grew more level, and we appeared to fly along. Then the mountains seemed to come nearer to us on each side and to frown down upon us. We were entering the Borgo Pass. One by one, several of the passengers offered me gifts, which they pressed upon me with an earnestness which would take no denial. These were certainly of an odd and varied kind, but each was given in simple good faith with a kindly word of blessing and that strange mixture of fear meaning movements which I had seen outside the hotel at Bistritz, the sign of the cross and the guard against the evil eye. Then as we flew along, the driver leaned forward on each side, the passengers craning over the edge of the coach peered eagerly into the darkness. It was evident that something very exciting was either happening or expected. But though I asked each passenger, no one would give me the slightest explanation. This state of excitement kept on for some little time, and at last we saw before us the pass opening out on the eastern side. There were dark, rolling clouds overhead, and in the air the heavy, oppressive sense of thunder. It seemed as though the mountain range had separated two atmospheres. And now that we had gotten to the thunderous one, I was myself looking out for the conveyance which was to take me to the count. Each moment I expected to see the glare of lamps through the blackness, but all was dark. The only light was the flickering rays of our own lamp in which the steam from our hard-driven horses rose in a white cloud. We could see now this sandy road lying white before us, but there was on it no sign of a vehicle. The passengers drew back with a sigh of gladness, which seemed to mock my own disappointment. I was already thinking what I had best to do when the driver, looking at his watch, said to the other something which I could barely hear. It was spoken so quietly and in so low a tone, I thought it was an hour less than the time. Then turning to me, he said in German, worse than my own, and I'll stop reading there because that's all of the passage I picked. Okay, so take a minute, go through, highlight any other words and images that you think create that ominous, dangerous, something bad is about to happen feeling. What I want you to think about as you're doing this highlighting is that I want you to know that authors make choices when they write. Brom Stoker wanted the audience to feel this fear, trepidation, this sense of impending evil, doom, something was coming. So he chose those words and those images specifically to create this feeling in the reader. Okay, good writers don't just wave a magic wand. We don't pray and then wait for like the clouds to part and a beam of light to shine down and angels to sing, ah, 
and then all of a sudden we write this beautiful work. That's not how it happens. It's a craft that happens as we write and revise and write and revise and write and revise again. And through each of those revisions, Stoker chose these words to create this effect on the reader. And so we're just pulling back a little bit and noticing that. And once you've identified those, I want you to go into Google Classroom. And I want you to go to the other chapter one where it says Dracula chapter one analysis. Go ahead and pull open that document. It looks like this. Oh gosh, I hope I did this right for you guys. I did not. Okay, it says students. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Okay, what you'll have to do is you'll have to make a copy of it. So you're in this file, you'll come to file, and you'll go to make a copy. Okay, and then you can just put your name on it. Okay, so copy of Jack, Dracula Chapter 1 Analysis, Kelly Ritchie. You could just be your first name. Okay, so that's you. And you'll turn this into me. <clears throat> Okay, and so here's a chart. You're going to find three examples of those language choices that the author makes to create that feeling, okay? So here's the example I picked. He lashed the horses unmercifully. How does that create the ominous feeling? Well, to me, I said the driver is beating the horses like he's frantic to get somewhere or like he's running from something because he's scared. This makes me feel like something bad is chasing him or like he wants to get something over with. He does not feel safe, okay? So that's what that image tells me. You're going to pick three other words or images and you're going to complete this chart, all right? And we're thinking about the choices that Bram Stoker made. Then you're going to read chapter two. I'm going to give you guys about 15 minutes to fill out the chart, and then I'm going to read chapter two out loud. So if you want to read it out loud with me, you certainly can. I'll see you here in 15 minutes. Okay? Are you done, Jakai? All right. Not so hard, right? Okay. Mm-hmm.
Okay, we have about two minutes left before we start reading chapter two. Oh, uh, Miss Richie. Hey. Did Miss Newman I, say anything? I say it again. Did Miss Newman end up like saying anything? No, and I forgot. Well, it's because I forgot. So let me do that right now while you guys are doing this. Oh, okay. I'm All so right. sorry. It's okay. Hang on. Hey. Okay, Benjamin, the issue is you didn't get a grade for the third six weeks. You didn't get a failing grade, you just got no grade. So it couldn't calculate your semester, which is why you didn't get your credit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to email your counselor, and um, I'm going to do that right now, and I'm going to CC you on the email so she can just reply back to you or you can reply back to her, okay? And if you don't... So for some reason, like, the class just disappeared from my schedule. I don't know why. Okay. That's the entire time. Um, that's, I have no idea why, but we're going to figure that out and, um, get you your grade in there so you get your credit. Okay. So right. let me send the email right now. All right.
Okay, Benjamin, I just sent an email to your student email and to your counselor, Ms. Fernandez. So she should respond to you or both of us and we'll figure out what we have to do next, okay? All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody else, it has been 20 minutes, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna read chapter two out loud. If you prefer not to hear me reading it and to read it on your own, that is fine. You can hop off the meeting and read it on your own. If you want to hear it read out loud, stick around. If you want to hear it read aloud, but not from me, I have put on Google Classroom, look, I made Dracula, Dracula, thank you. Okay, then I put on here a, um, what is this called? This is called materials, right? And so if you click that, there's a link to the YouTube audio version of it and then to the Project Gutenberg text if you still don't have it. If you go to the YouTube audio of it, and actually go to YouTube, where it is, um, in the menu on the side, your you will see, better. Gosh, um, you will see, this is chapter one, and it should automatically play chapter two, three, four, all of them. It'll go to chapter two next, then it'll go to chapter three, then it'll go to chapter four. So it's got all of them. You can also just click on his name, even Red Fox Garrett, and it'll pull it up. You can find other versions of the audiobook if you would prefer. So there is some choice available to you guys about how you want to proceed with reading the book. All right. Um, as long as you are reading the unabridged version of Dracula, the actual text, we're good. Um, and then we'll be dissecting sections of that text in class. So far, we've read one chapter, done a little bit of dissection of the, the mood, the ominous feeling. We're going to read chapter two, and then next class period, we'll be dissecting the characters of Dracula and Jonathan Harker himself. We'll talk about whether Jonathan's a reliable narrator. Can we trust him? Um, and then we'll move on, and we'll, we'll start adding a little bit more to our reading, but right now we're just starting out, okay? All right, so without further ado, if you stick around, here we go with chapter two. And if you decide to leave, have a great day, and I will see you on Wednesday. Okay, chapter two. And here, I'll just drop the text one more time into... Awesome, Alden, okay. Uh, so if you want to go to Project Gutenberg, here we go. Jonathan Harker's journal continued. 5th of May. I must have been asleep. For certainly, if I had been fully awake, I must have noticed the approach of such a remarkable place. In the gloom, the courtyard looked of considerable size. And as several dark ways led from it under great round arches, it perhaps seemed bigger than it really is. I have not yet been able to see it by daylight. When the um, chalice, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, <laughs> stopped, the driver jumped down and held out his hand to assist me to alight. Again, I could not but notice his prodigious strength. His hand actually seemed like a steel vice that could have crushed mine if he had chosen. Then he took out my traps and placed them on the ground beside me as I stood close to a great door, old and studded with large iron nails and set a projecting doorway of massive stone. I could see it even in the dim light that the stone was massively carved, but that the carving had been much worn by time and weather. As I stood, the driver jumped again into his seat and shook the reins. The horses started forward and trap and all disappeared down one of the dark openings. I stood in silence where I was, for I did not know what to do. A bell or knocker, there was no sign. Though these frowning walls and dark window openings, it was not likely that my voice could penetrate. The time I waited seemed endless, and I felt doubts and fears crowding upon me. What sort of place had I come to, and among what kind of people? What sort of grim adventure was it on which I had embarked? Was this a customary incident in the life of a solicitor's clerk sent out to explain the purchase of a London estate to a foreigner? Solicitor's clerk. Mina would not like that. Solicitor, for just being, before leaving London, I got word that my examination was successful. I am now a full-blown solicitor. I began to rub my eyes and pinch myself to see if I were awake. It all seemed like a horrible nightmare to me. 
and I expected that I should suddenly awake and find myself at home with the dawn struggling in through the windows as I had now and again felt the morning a day after their overwork. But my flesh answered the pinching test and my eyes were not to be deceived. I was indeed awake and among the Carpathians. All I could do now was to be patient and to wait for the upcoming, to wait for the coming of the morning. Just as I had come to this conclusion, I heard a heavy step approaching behind the great door and saw through the chinks the gleam of a coming light. With the sound of rattling chains and the clanking of massive bolts drawn back, the key was turned with the loud grating noise of long disuse and the great door swung back. Within stood a tall old man, clean shaven save for a long white mustache and clad in black from head to foot without a single speck of color about him anywhere. He held in his hand an antique silver lamp in which the flame burned without chimney or globe of any kind, throwing long quivering shadows as it flickered in the draught of the open door. The old man motioned me in with his right hand and with a courtly gesture saying in excellent English, but with a strange intonation, welcome to my house, enter freely and of your own will. He made no motion of stepping to meet me, but stood like a statue as though his gesture of welcome had fixed him into stone. The instant, however, that I stepped over the threshold, he moved impulsively forward and holding out his hand, grasped mine with the strength which made me wince, an effort which was not lessened by the fact that it seemed as cold as ice. Felt more like the hand of a dead than a living man. And again, he said, welcome to my house. Come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. The strength of the handshake was so much akin to that which I had noticed in the driver, whose face I had not seen, that for a moment I doubted if it were not the same person to whom I was speaking. So to make sure, I said interrogatively, of Dracula? He bowed in a courtly way as he replied, I am Dracula, and I bid you welcome, Mr. Harker, to my house. Come in, the night air is chill, and you must need to eat and rest. He was speaking, he put the lamp on a bracket on the wall and stepping out took my luggage. He had carried it in before I could forestall him. I protested, but he insisted, nay, sir, you are my guest. It is late and my people are not available. Let me see to your comfort myself. He insisted on carrying my traps along the passage and then up a great winding stair and along another great passage on whose stone floor our steps rang heavily. The end of this, he threw open a heavy door, and I rejoiced to see within a well-lit room in which the table was spread for supper, and on whose mighty hearth a great fire of logs freshly replenished flamed and flared. The count halted, putting down my bags, closed the door, and crossing the room opened another door, which led into a small octagonal room lit by a single lamp and seemingly without a window of any sort. Passing through this, he opened another door and motioned me to enter. It was a welcome sight for there was a great bedroom, well and lighted and warmed with another log on the fire. Also added to but lately for the top logs were fresh, which sent a hollow roar up the wide chimney. The Count himself left my luggage inside and withdrew saying before he closed the door, you will need after your journey to refresh yourself by making your toilet. I trust you will find all you wish. When you are ready, come to the other room where you will find your supper prepared. The light and warmth and the Count's courteous welcome seemed to have dissipated all of my doubts and fears. Having then reached my normal state, I discovered that I was half famished with hunger. So making a hasty toilet, I went out to the other room. I found supper already laid out. My host, who stood on the side of the great fireplace leaning against the stonework, made a graceful wave of his hand to the table and said, I pray you be seated and sup how you please. You will, I trust, excuse me that I do not join you, but I have dined already and I do not sup. I handed to him the sealed letter which Mr. Hawkins had entrusted to me. I opened it and read it gravely, then with a charming smile, he handed it across to me to read. One passage of it at least gave me a thrill of pleasure. I must regret that an attack of gout from which malady I am a constant sufferer forbids absolutely any traveling on my part for some time to come. But I am happy to say I can send a sufficient substitute one in whom I have every possible confidence. He is a young man full of energy and talent in his own way and of a very faithful disposition. He is discreet and silent and has grown into manhood in my service. He shall be ready to attend upon you with, uh, attend upon you when you will during his stay and shall take your instructions in all matters. The Count himself came forward and took off the cover of a dish and I fell at once into an excellent roast chicken. 
This with some cheese and salad and a bottle of old Tolke, of which I had two glasses with my supper. During the time I was eating it, the Count asked me many questions as to my journey, and I told him by degrees all I had experienced. By the time I had finished my supper, and by my host's desire, had drawn up a chair by the fire and begun to smoke a cigar which he offered me, at the same time excusing himself that he did not smoke. I had now an opportunity of observing him and found him to be of a very marked um, physiognomy, can't really say that, but his physical appearance. <laughs> his face was strong, very strong, aquiline, with a high bridge and a thin nose and particularly arched nostrils, with lofty domed forehead and hair growing scantily around the temples but profusely everywhere. His eyebrows were massive, almost meeting over the nose with bushy hair that seemed to curl of its own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see under its heavy mustache, was fixed and rather cruel looking with particularly sharp or peculiarly sharp white teeth. These protruded over the lips whose remarkable ruddiness showed astonishing vitality in a man of his years. For the rest, his ears were pale and at the tops extremely pointed. The chin was broad and strong and his cheeks firm and though thin. The general effect was one of extraordinary pallor. Hitherto I had noticed the backs of his hands as they lay on his knees in the firelight, and they had seemed rather white and fine, but seeing them now close to me, I could not but notice that they were rather coarse and broad with squat fingers. Strange to say, there were hairs in the center of the palm. The nails were long and fine and cut to a sharp point. Count leaned over me and his hands touched me. I could not repress a shudder. It may have been that his breath was rank, but a horrible feeling of nausea came over me, which, do what I would, I could not conceal. The Count, evidently noticing it, drew back and with a grim sort of smile, which showed more than he had yet done to his protuberant teeth, sat himself down again on his own side and listened, I heard, as if from down below in the valley, the howling of many wolves. The Count's eyes gleamed and he said, listen to them, the children of the night, what music they make. Seeing, I suppose, some expression in my face strange to him, he added, Ah, sir, you dwellers in the city cannot enter into the feelings of the hunter. He rose and he said, But you must be tired. Your bedroom is all ready. And tomorrow you shall sleep as late as you will. I have to be away till the afternoon. So sleep well and dream well. With a courteous bow, he opened for me himself the door to the octagonal room, and I entered my bedroom. I am all in a sea of wonders, doubt, fear, I think strange things, which I dare not confess to my own soul. God keep me, if only for the sake of those dear to me. 7 May. It is again early morning, and I have rested and enjoyed the last 24 hours. I slept until late in the day and awoke of my own accord. When I addressed myself, I went into the room where we had slept and found a cold breakfast laid out with coffee kept hot by the pot being placed on the hearth. There was a card on the table on which was written, I do have to be absent for a while. Do not wait for me. D. I set to and enjoyed a hearty meal. When I had done, I looked for a bell so that I might let the servants know I had finished, but I could not find one. There are certainly odd deficiencies in the house, considering the extraordinary evidences of wealth which are around me. Table service is of gold and so beautifully wrought that it must be of immense value. The curtains and upholstery of the chairs and sofas and hangings of my bed are of the costliest and most beautiful fabrics and must have been of fabulous value when they were made. Oh, sorry. Um, and must have been moth-eaten. Where? It must have been a fabulous value when they were made, for they are centuries old, though in excellent order. I saw something like them in Hampton Court, but they were, they were worn and frayed and moth-eaten. But still, in none of these rooms is there a mirror, not even a toilet glass on my table. I had to get the little shaving glass from my bag before I could either shave or brush my hair. And I have not yet seen a servant anywhere or heard a sound near the castle except the howling of wolves. Sometime later, after I had finished my meal, I do not know whether to call it a breakfast or a dinner, for it was between five and six o'clock when I had it. I looked about for something to read, for I did not like to go about the castle until I had asked the Count's permission. There was absolutely nothing in the room, book, newspaper, or even writing materials. So I opened another door in the room and found a sort of library. The door opposite mine I tried, but I found it locked. In the library, I found to my great delight a vast number of English books, whole shelves full of them, and bound volumes of magazines and newspapers. The table in the center was littered with English magazines and newspapers, though none of them were very recent dates. 
The books were the most varied kind, history, geography, politics, political economy, botany, geology, law, all relating to England and English life and customs and manners. There were even such books of reference as the London Directory, the Red and Blue Books, Whittier's Almanac, the Army and Navy List, and, it somehow glad my heart to see it, the Law List. While I was looking at the books, the door opened and the Count entered. He saluted me in a hearty way and hoped that I had a good night's rest, and then he went on. Glad you found your way in here, for I'm sure there is much that will interest you. These companions, he laid his hands on some of the books, have been good friends to me, and for some years past, ever since I had the idea of going to London, have given me many, many hours of pleasure. Through them, I have come to know your great England, and to know her is to love her. I long to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London, to be in the midst of the whirl and rush of humanity, to share its life, its change, its death, and all that makes it what it is, but alas, can only know your tongue through books. To you, my friend, I look that I know it to speak. Count, I said, you know and speak English thoroughly, he bowed gravely. I thank you, my friend, for your too flattering estimate. But yet I fear that I am but a little way on the road I would travel. True, I know the grammar and the words, but yet I know not how to speak them. Indeed, I said, you speak excellently. Not so, he answered. Well, I know that I did move and speak in your London, none there who would know me for a stranger. That is not enough for me. Here I am a noble, I am a boyar, the common people know me and I am master. But a stranger in a strange land, he is no one. Men know him and know not is to care not for. I am content if I am like the rest, so that no man stops if he see me or pause his speaking if he hear my words. Ha ha, a stranger. I have been so long a master that I would be a master still, or at least that none other should be the master of me. You come to me not alone as my agent of my friend Peter Hawkins of Exeter to tell me about my new estate in London. You shall, I trust, rest here with me a while, so that by our talking, I may learn the English intonation. And I would that you tell me when I make an error, even of the smallest in my speaking. I'm sorry that I had to be away so long today, but you will, I know, forgive one who has so many important affairs at hand. Of course, I said all I could about being willing and asked if I might come into the room when I chose, and he answered, yes, certainly, and added, you may go anywhere you wish in the castle, except where the doors are locked, where, of course, you will not wish to go. There is a reason that things are as they are. Did you not see with my eyes and know with my knowledge you would perhaps better understand? Then I was sure of all this, and then he went on. We are in Transylvania. This is not England. Our ways are not your ways. And there shall be to you many strange things. Nay, from what you have told me of your experiences already, you know something of what strange things there may be. This led to much conversation, as it was evidence he wanted to talk, if only for talking's sake. I asked him many questions regarding the things that had happened to me or come within my notice. Sometimes he shared off the subject or turned the conversation by pretending not to understand. But generally, he answered all I asked, most frankly. And then as time went on, and I had gotten somewhat bolder, I asked him some of the strange things of the preceding night. For instance, why the coachman went to the places where he had seen the blue flames. And then he explained to me that it was commonly believed that on a certain night of the year, last night in fact, when all the evil spirits are supposed to have unchecked sway, a blue flame is seen over any place where a treasure has been concealed. Your treasure has been hidden, he went on, in the region through which you came last night. And there can be but little doubt, for it was the ground fought over for centuries by the um, Wallachian, the Saxon, and the Turk. Why there is hardly a foot in the soil in all this region that has not been enriched by the blood of men, patriots, or invaders. In the old days, there were stirring times when the Austrian and the Hungarian came up in hordes, and the patriots went out to meet them, men and women, aged and children too, and waited for their coming on the rocks above the passes so that they might sweep destruction on them with their artificial avalanches. When the invader was triumphant that he found but little, for whatever there has been had been sheltered in the friendly soil. But how, I said, can it have remained so long undiscovered, when there is sure to index to it if the men will but take the trouble to look? Count smiled and his lips ran back over his gums, the long, sharp canine teeth showed out strangely, and he answered, Because your peasant is at heart a coward and a fool. Those flames only appear on one night, and on that night no man of this land will, if he can help it, stir without his doors. And, dear sir, even if he did, he would not know what to do. Why, the peasant will tell you, me, of who marked this place as a flame, would not know where to look in the daylight even for his own work. 
even you would not, I dare be sworn, be able to find these places again. There you are right, I said. I know no more than the dead or even to look for them. Then we drifted into other matters. Come here, he said at last, and tell me of London and the house which you have procured for me. With an apology for my remissness, I went into my own room to get the papers from my bag. Whilst I was placing it in order, I heard a rattling of china and silver in the next room. And as I passed through, noticed that the table had been cleared, the lamp lit, for it was by this time deep into the dark. The lamps were also lit in the study or library, and I found the Count lying on the sofa reading, of all things in the world, the English Bradshaw's Guide. When I came in, he cleared the books and papers from the table, and with him I went into the plans and deeds and figures of all sorts. He was interested in everything and asked me myriad questions about the place, its surroundings. He clearly had studied beforehand all he could get on the subject of the neighborhood, for evidently, at the end, he knew much more than I did. When I remarked, he answered, how we doing, guys? Brianna, Benjamin, are we good? Ava, how you doing? Kaya? Mm -hmm. All right, let's take just a minute and stretch. Oof. You hear my back pop? It's a lot of strength reading, especially if you're the one reading. But here we have creepy Count Dracula with his long fingernails and pointy teeth, wanting to learn all things English. And Jonathan Harker ignoring every single sign, <laughs> right? Okay, hang on. I don't know if I'm presenting, but I want to. Okay, here we are. All right. Okay, um, when I remarked this, he answered, well, but my friend, is it not needful that I should? When I go there, I shall be alone, and my friend Harper Jonathan may pardon me. I fall into my country's habit of putting your patriana, patronymic name first. My friend Jonathan Harker will not be by my side to correct and aid me. He will be in Exeter, miles away, probably working at Papers of the Law with my other friend Peter Hawkins. So. We went thoroughly into the business of the purchase of the estate at Perfleet. When I told him of the facts and got his signature on the necessary papers and had written a letter with him ready to post to Mr. Hawkins, he began to ask me how I came across so suitable a place. And I read to him the notes which I had made at the time, which I inscribed here. At Perfleet, on a by road, I came across just such a place as seemed to be required where there was displayed a dilapidated notice that the place was for sale. It is surrounded by a high wall of ancient structure built of heavy stones and has not been repaired for a large number of years. The closed gates are heavy or of a heavy old oak and iron, all eaten with rust. This state is called Carfax, no doubt a corruption of the old quattro face, a house that is four-sided, agreeing with the cardinal points of the compass. It contains in all some 20 acres, quite surrounded by the solid stone wall of the above mentioned. There are many trees on it which make it in places gloomy and there is a deep dark looking pond or small lake evidently fed by some springs as the water is clear and flows away in a fair sized stream. The house is a very large and of all periods back I should say to medieval times. For one part of the stone immensely thick with only a few windows high up and heavily barred with iron it looks like part of a keep and is close to an old chapel or a church. I could not enter it as I had not the key of the door leading to it from the house, but I have yet taken with my Kodak views of it from various points. The house has been added to, but in a very straggling way, and I can only guess at the amount of ground it covers, which must be very great. There are but few houses close at hand, one being very large house only recently added to and formed in a private lunatic asylum. It is not, however, visible from the ground. When I had finished, he said, I am glad that it is old and big. I myself am of an old family, and to live in a new house would kill me. A house cannot be made habitable in a day, and, after all, how few days ago to make up a century. I rejoice at there being a chapel of old times. We Transylvanian nobles have not to think that our bones may lie amongst the common dead. Seek not gaiety, nor mirth, nor the bright voluptuousness of the sunshine or the sparkling waters which please the young and gay. I am no longer young, and my heart... Though weary years of mourning over the dead is not attuned to mirth. Moreover, the walls of my castle are broken. The shadows are many. The wind breaches the cold through the broken battlements and casements. I love the shade and the shadow and would be alone with my thoughts when I may. 
Somehow his words and his look did not seem into accord, or else it was that his cast of face made him smile look malignant and saturnine. Presently, with an excuse, he left me, asking me to put all my papers together. He was some little while away, and I began to look up at some of the books around me. One was an atlas, which I found openly naturally in England, as if that map had been much used. On looking at it, I found certain places, little rings marked. On examining these, I noticed that one was near London on the east side, manifestly where his new estate was situated, and the other two were Exeter and Whitby and New Yorkshire Coast. It was the much better of an hour when the Count returned. Aha, he said, still at your book? Good. But you must not work always. Come. I am informed that your supper is ready. He took my arm, and we went into the next room where I found an excellent supper ready at the table. The Count again excused himself as he had dined out being away from home, but he sat on as in the previous night and chatted while I ate. After supper, I smoked, and on the last evening, and the Count stayed with me, chatting and asking questions on every conceivable subject, hour after hour. I felt that it was getting very late indeed, but I did not say anything, for I felt under obligation to meet my host's wishes in every way. Not sleepy. As the long sleep yesterday had fortified me, but I could not help experiencing that chill which comes over one at the coming of dawn, which is like, in its way, the turn of the tide. They say that people who live near death die generally at the change of the dawn or at the turn of the tide, and anyone has, when tired and, and tied as if it were to his post, experienced this change in the atmosphere, can well believe it. All at once, we heard the cock the crow of a cock coming up with a paternal shrillness through the clear mountain air. Count Dracula, jumping to his feet, said, Why, there is the morning again. How remiss I am to let you stay up so long. You must make your conversation regarding my dear new country of England less interesting, so that I may not forget how time flies by us. And with a courtly bow, he quickly left me. I went into my own room and drew the curtain. There was but little notice. My window opened up into the courtyard, and all I could see was the warm gray of quickening sky. So I pulled the curtains again and have written of this day. 8 May. I began to fear as I write in this book that I was getting too diffuse. But now I'm glad that I went into detail from the first, for there is something so strange about this place and in all and all in it that I cannot but feel uneasy. I wish I were safe out of it and that I had never come. It may be that the strange night existence is telling on me, but would that were all. If there were anyone to talk to, I could bear it, but there is no one. I have only the Count to speak with me, and he? Well, I fear I am myself the only living soul within the place. Let me be prosaic, so far as facts can be. It will help bear me up. And imagination must not run riot within me. For if it does, I am lost. Let me say at once how I stand or seem to. I only slept a few hours when I went to bed. And feeling that I could not sleep anymore, I got up and I hung my shaving glass by the window and was just beginning to shave. Suddenly, I felt a hand at my shoulder and I heard the Count's voice saying to me, good morning. I started, for it amazed me that I had not seen him since the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. And starting, I had cut myself slightly, but did not notice it at the moment. Having answered the Count's salutation, I turned to the glass to see how I had been mistaken. This time, there could be no error. For the man was close to me, and I could see him over my shoulder, but there was no reflection of him in the mirror. The old room behind me was displayed, but there was no sign of a man in it except myself. This was startling, and coming on top of so many strange things was beginning to increase that vague feeling of an evening easiness which I have always had when the Count is near. But at the instant I saw the cut had bled a little, and the blood was trickling over my chin. I laid down the razor, turning as I did, so half round to look for some sticking paper. When the Count saw my face, his eyes blazed with a sort of demonic fury, and he suddenly made a grab at my throat. I drew away, and his hand touched the string of beads, which held the crucifix. It made an instant change in him, and the fury passed so quickly that I could hardly believe it was ever there. Take care, he said. Take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. Then, seizing the shaving glass, he went on, and this is the wretched thing that has done the mischief. It is a foul bauble of man's vanity. Away with it! And opening the heavy window with one wrench of his terrible hand, he flung out the glass, which was shattered into a thousand pieces on the stones in the courtyard below. Then he withdrew without a word. Very annoying, for I do not see how I am to shave, unless in my wide watch case or the bottom of a shaving pot, which is fortunately of metal, when I went into the dining room, breakfast was prepared, but I could not find the count anywhere. So I breakfasted alone. 
It is strange that as yet I have not seen the count eat or drink. He must be a very peculiar man. After breakfast, I did a little exploring in the castle. Went out to the stairs and found a room looking toward the south. The view was magnificent. and From where I stood, there was ever opportunity of seeing it. The castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. Stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. As far as the eye can reach is a sea of green treetops, occasionally a rift where there is a chasm. But here and there are silver threads where rivers and wind wind in deep gorges through the forest. But I am not of a heart to describe its beauty, for when I had seen the view, I explored further, doors and doors everywhere, all locked and bolted, in no place save from the windows in the castle with their avail an available exit. The castle is a veritable prison, and I am a prisoner. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so that is chapter two of Dracula, and I am reading online, and everybody has left me. For you, Ava. <laughs>